So hello and good evening, everyone. We are just waiting for a couple of seconds more since normally, as you probably know very well, the participants, the attendees um, start to enter um, the room. Um, and we would like to give each and everyone a chance to listen. So please wait for a few seconds more before we start our um, tonight's webinar. But you are right, um, if you are interested in Ukraine, if you are interested in the today's webinar, Who is Who on Bankova, uh, with our guest, I will shortly introduce uh, in a minute. So please wait for a couple of seconds more. If uh, you would like to follow on us on uh, Facebook, uh, you are very welcome to watch us there. If you have questions, uh, we try to be as interactive as we can. So we can uh, use the Q&A uh, section and you can post your questions there at any time. I will read them out loud or some of our participants can individually answer them. So I see there are a couple of people as participants. Hello and good evening once again. My name is Viola van Kremen. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the group Greens IFA. Uh, and uh, not only, I'm also a member of the AFED committee, Committee for Foreign Affairs, as well as the vice chair for the EU delegation, EU Ukraine delegation. For tonight, I'm very glad that we could um, uh, invite many excellent speakers to have some uh, remarks and comments and hopefully very interesting input um, to our new study, which we have uh, recently commissioned. And we have also amongst us the author of this study, Marina uh, Shevtsova. Uh, hello and good evening. Very welcome uh, to you, Marina, tonight. Um, well, maybe a few minutes um, or a few seconds on the background of this study, why we think it is important. Um, President Zelensky was elected in 2019 uh, with an overwhelming uh, majority of uh, 73%. And it was especially interesting while he portrayed himself as a non-politician, as an ordinary person, as, as someone with not any political experience and people seem to like it. They seem to say, well, that's a chance. That's something for Ukraine you really want. We do not want the old generation, the old political elite, mainly fighting for their own interests. So we would like to have somebody from outside who is honest, who has a good agenda, where nobody really knew exactly what his agenda was, but at least he could make sure that he has no own business interest, uh, that he would fight corruption, that he would fight for integrity, he would fight for rule of law, for strengthening the institution. And that, I think, echoed very well um, amongst the voters. Uh, so he had a landslide, um, landslide uh, victory, uh, which was surprising, actually, for many of us, at least um, many of us outside of of Ukraine, and we have seen that he could even manage from the west to central Ukraine, to the east, to the south, to get a majority. There were only a few people who really would like to see a continuation of the old Poroshenko, whether we call it reform agenda or at least a continuation of the reform of, of Poroshenko's agenda. And now, after almost two years, um, having him in office, I think that some people have doubts, uh, doubts on different um, levels, but also on his, let's say, closest alliance, his circle around him, uh, people who advise him, people who make finally decisions for him, who, who, people who are able to take responsibility in very important fields. And therefore, um, we have asked Marina Shevtsova to have a closer look in what are and who are actually the people around Zelensky who are mainly, uh, I mean, responsible for these uh, important decisions and also for international relations, but for many domestic uh, decisions. 
and uh, tonight we would like to have like a, a three uh, a pillar or three um, category um, um, webinar. So first, uh, listen to Marina, the uh, main results, the outcomes uh, from, from her perspective, uh, and also how the methodology was behind this uh, study. Uh, and then you have the uh, opportunity to maybe um, raise some questions, uh, especially to her, her content, her procedure, and how she has uh, structured her, her study. Uh, the next round would be then from the domestic dim uh, dimension, look a little bit closer. Uh, what is this uh, study worth? Uh, why it might be interesting? to have a closer look uh, on the actual players in Ukraine, what has changed, where is, let's say, chances, challenges, danger. And so I'm very happy that we could invite um, uh, many uh, well-known uh, speakers uh, from Ukraine, but also from the European Parliament. First of all, there is Ruslan Rybachapka. He is the former prosecutor from Ukraine. We have met in Brussels once before, but uh, we know that you are now um, in the planning of an old think tank uh, with, let's say, different other ex-politicians uh, uh, and also smart people from Ukraine. So we are looking forward um, to hear some more from you concerning the current situation in Ukraine, but also your plans. Then, of course, uh, we have somebody who is also well known uh, since he is the um, head of the chair um, uh, and the director for international uh, relations um, and the school for policy analysis of the National University in Kiev, uh, Maxim Yakolev. Uh, he is a well known um, analysis uh, from, from Kiev, but not only since he has, I mean, many, many fields of um, occupation and knowledge in the European uh, fields, in the German-Ukrainian uh, relations. So uh, a perfect match for our questions tonight, as well as many of you will know uh, Daria Kalinuk uh, as uh, the head of uh, ANTAC. Uh, anti-corruption center uh, in Ukraine, and also a very critical but very constructive voice when it comes to, let's say, the reform agenda in Ukraine in general. And uh, she, is, she is witness and observing the situation um, for the last years, I would say, very, very uh, closely, and is a very close ally also for us in the European Parliament. And in the European Parliament, I can welcome my colleague Mika Egala, who is not only well known in Ukraine, but who is, um, I think, a perfect um, observer since he is the standing rapporteur um, for Ukraine. Um, he is also the lead member uh, in the DEC committee uh, for Ukraine. So he's not working only on, let's say, the overall, but also on mediation, on domestic issues in particular. And he has a, I would say, very um, intense um, overview of the different reform agenda for the last decades. So, Marina, uh, would you like to start and uh, give us um, a quick overview and some insights uh, from your finding of the studies, who is who on Bankova? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Viola. Just a second, I will share my presentation. Okay, should be all right. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for being here today. Thanks a lot, Viola and Nicholas, for organizing this event. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be presenting today this short summary of the research uh, that I uh, conducted uh, starting from October uh, last year until January 2021. And of course, I have to say it was a challenging task to write this research once uh, first, because uh, always writing on Ukrainian politics is uh, writing on something so dynamic and hectic uh, uh, and you feel like you're trying to shoot a moving target. 
And secondly, because we had the, uh, the pandemic and we are continuing with pandemic and uh, it was difficult to reach people and uh, to convince them to talk to me. But of course, it was not only due to the pandemic, but also to due to some reservations that people had, uh, being afraid to talk and being afraid to disclose certain, kind, certain types of information. And I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation to around uh, 20 interviews that found time and courage to talk to me. And among those who were in peace were civil society activists and uh, policymaker and experts. And uh, if you find, if you read the report, you will also see that most of them have uh, chosen not to disclose their identity, which is again, the question of why, right? And it uh, tells us some things about Ukrainian politics. And apart from that, I was uh, using, of course, official data sources, policies, laws, uh, draft laws, newspapers, shadow reports, and investigative journalism helped a lot, uh, as well as expert reports. As uh, uh, Viola told already, the focus of the report was uh, the uh, office of the president, uh, of the president of President Zelensky, and um, the office of the president is the body that uh, originally is supposed to provide administrative, advisory, analytical, and um, legal assistance to the president. Uh, yet, uh, however, uh, uh, as we can see during the Zelensky's presidency, this body had accumulated uh, way more influence and way more uh, power of Ukrainian politics, which covers a certain key appointments, strategic uh, foreign politics decisions, and relationship with, uh, all, with Ukrainian oligarchs and uh, financial groups. So uh, when Zelensky was running for presidency, um, a couple of uh, two, two years ago, actually already more than two years ago, uh, the administration of the president, which is now called the office, was a part of the system that uh, Zelensky was promising to uh, to change or to break. Uh, he was referring to it uh, as to a need to clear up the mess. So he was saying that the administration was overstaffed, that it was con consuming way too much budget. And this is something that will be would be different with him. So one of the overarching questions that the report was asking was whether those transformation really took place, whether new people came to the office, which uh, made the office function differently, uh, who are those people, and um, whether there is uh, the reason to look optimistically at the future of Ukrainian democratization. And while since today I have only uh, 10 minutes or 10 to 12 minutes, uh, I will uh, try to talk mostly about the findings and I will leave the discussion about the you know, um, implications and uh, hopes to uh, my colleagues uh, and guests uh, out here. So the report also touches uh, upon the uh, story of the first head of the office, uh, Andriy Bogdan, uh, and uh, discusses him a little bit and uh, the period when he was in the office. But uh, today I will jump right to the current head of the office, Andrei Yermak, and uh, his figure as uh, the figure of one of the most influential or one of the most influential, per influential persons in Ukrainian politics today. And uh, I would like to mention here some concerns that were raised in uh, almost all the interviews that I had, including those, and maybe this is the most interesting, with the people from the faction of Zelensky in the Verkhovna Rada, uh, the servant of the people faction and the party. And the first concern, the, the, the loudest one, was, of course, the limited communication and the, the limited, uh, the restricted access that the uh, people have to, uh, to the office and uh, to the president himself, uh, which uh, uh, is said to be very different from the time when Andriy Bogdan was in the office. And uh, what, what has been mentioned is uh, that uh, uh, no matter what party, uh, uh, what, what party's member was talking to me, what was mentioned is uh, the decisions that are coming as imposed from the office uh, or from Zelensky uh, to the faction in the Verkhovna Rada without any consultation about the MP opinion of the MPs. And whatever, whatever opinion my interviews were uh, you know, voicing, the common understanding was that as of December 2020 or January 2021, uh, the power uh, in the office is too much uh, accumulated in hands of three people, which are, uh, of course, President Zelensky and then Andriy Yermak and um, Sergei Shefir, to uh, these two being old friends uh, of Zelensky from his show business times. Uh, so considering the lack of communication I mentioned, it is not surprising that the next stories or the cases that came up uh, in, uh, public, uh, in um, public discussion uh, provoked even more distrust and doubts uh, among even those closest to President Zelensky. And I will briefly mention those, and again, uh, please um, 
uh, I encourage you to read the report if you want to, uh, to know more details. So the first one being the debate around the prisoner swap. And this one started even before Andrei Yermak became the head of the office. Uh, and uh, if you remember, probably when he came to the office, he was much welcomed uh, before because uh, uh, pretty much due to the uh, praise that he got a negotiating or supervising the negotiation with Kremlin all this uh, uh, swap of the prisoners uh, from, from between Ukraine and Kremlin. But what was scandalous there, it was that following Kremlin's demand, uh, five Berkut Raya's policemen were, that were charged with killing 48 and injuring 80 protesters during Euromaidan times were also released to Russia. And while it was uh, kind of excused or justified by the office uh, by saying that the life of any uh, Ukrainian prisoner going back to Ukraine is worthy of uh, whatever, uh, how many uh, Berkut policemen released to Russia and that the, the investigation will, would continue, uh, still uh, this, uh, this uh, kind of left uh, a serious question mark uh, on those uh, forming the uh, civil society activists and on the families uh, of those died during Euromaidan events. And uh, uh, pretty much quickly, uh, soon afterwards, when Andrei Yermak became the head of the office, uh, the next scandal came, and it was, of course, a scandal with uh, Geolera's recordings, or the recordings published by former advisor uh, of uh, President Zelensky and former member of the faction of Zelensky in the parliament, uh, who published on his Facebook recordings demonstrating the brother of uh, Andrei Yermak, Denis Yermak, discussing certain services, um, which uh, were um, under uh, when, which were the services of providing for payment the access to some rewarding positions uh, in public institutions or in the government, and uh, it was impossible to refute or to reject the fact that it was Denis Yermak on those recordings, and he himself confirmed the fact. Uh, though uh, the office uh, refused the fact that the positions were sold, there was no real proof again that uh, that those positions were sold and which positions exactly, and again. The case was somehow, you know, um, hidden under the table or under the carpet, uh, but brought again more doubts among uh, among the deputy, among the MPs, and among the people in the office uh, and civil society activists. Clearly, and then there came several questionable appointments that uh, I believe should be mentioned. First one is the one of uh, uh, Vitoly Fokin, a uh, former prime minister of Ukraine, who was appointed as one, as one of the members of the so-called trilateral contact group on Ukraine, and who became very uh, famous, notoriously famous almost immediately as first in the interview to media outlet, uh, he uh, actually called for a general amnesty announcement in Donbas region and spatial status on the whole territories of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast. And uh, soon afterwards, as he was invited to explain himself at the special meeting of Verkhovna Rada, he went as far as to say that he didn't see any confirmation that there was war between Russia and Ukraine in the Donbas region, and that he personally would never have become an uh, enemy of Russia. And of course, the very same day, he was harshly criticized by Yermak, and that's how Fokin's career uh, in the uh, TCG uh, was finished. But the first question is uh, how and why was he appointed, first of all? And then there comes, of course, an even more problematic appointment of Oleg Totarov, who is still the deputy uh, of Andriy Yermak, and his name is still on the official website of the president's office. Well, this person is actually under the uh, current investigation concerning a corruption case opened against uh, the largest national building company, Ukurbut, where he worked as the uh, legal department head. But uh, even without mentioning this, uh, he was not supposed to be uh, uh, appointed to this position, firstly, because of his career uh, with uh, the Yanukovych government and his involvement into the uh, disbursement of uh, Euromaidan peaceful protest and his close relations with Andriy Partnov, former deputy head of the administration of ex-president. And then, there are more details, there are more letters, recordings, and there is Wagner, the, the so-called Wagner case, which I would love to discuss again more in detail, but uh, I'm afraid it will uh, take just too long uh, uh, of today's uh, presentation. And then second large issue that I would like to raise uh, among the findings is, of course, the relationship that the office has with the oligarchs. And uh, as Viola said already, President Zelensky was 
kind of portraying himself as this uh, new to politics man who will de -oler -de -oler -de guys, uh, whatever is the country that he will not sell uh, the political decisions to oligarchs. And even though there were those concerns that uh, his political campaign and uh, Andy Bogdan were too much too closely related to Kolomoisky and they were rejecting this fiercely, uh, what we see lately is, of course, that uh, clearly the relationship of the office with Kolomoisky is cooling down, yet we see new faces coming brighter. And uh, some of my interviewees went as far as to say, for example, that the whole office is now working for uh, Renat Akhmetov. And uh, there were also opinions raised or uh, uh, comments made about uh, how much money is going every month to MPs, uh, not only from Renat Akhmetov, but from other oligarchs and uh, how certain decisions are uh, being clearly made under the influence of this or that financial group. The last but not the least, which uh, I would like to briefly mention here, is clearly the influence that uh, oligarchy in Ukraine has over the media, since there is almost no strong independent media in Ukraine, and how badly President Zelensky uh, depends on uh, media portraying uh, him and uh, his rule favorably. So this, again, according to some sources, is part of the deal as the favorable portrait of the president in his office in exchange to uh, certain favors and uh, certain decisions made. Uh, just to um, summarize uh, the uh, the report or the most critical issues that I hope we will, we will be discussing further today is uh, most of the interviews, most of the sources agree that the biggest problem uh, seen or faced by uh, by Ukrainian in Ukrainian politics now from the side of the office is the lack of transparency and communications, extremely not transparent decision making, um, the connection to oligarchs and the financial groups. Then confusing attempts, especially lately, to control the media, but not all media. So we have uh, the uh, TV channels controlled by Renata Ahmeda, for example, running all around, but then those uh, be that belong to Viktor Medvedchuk are being shut down. Then, of course, and for that, uh, no interviews are needed. There is certain lack of competence and lack of experience, political expertise, and lack of strategic vision. And then the biggest question is that was raised many times, and that seems to confuse many people, is where is actually President Zelensky in all this? What is his position? Is indeed he is this good guy for whom he is, uh, the people around him created this bathtub regime, and he really doesn't know what's going on in the country, or is he the one who is actually well aware of what's going on and you know, also making his influence and playing, having has, uh, his firm say in this? And uh, to that, I hope uh, we will get some answers today. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot to you, Marina. That was a very well uh, drafted overview of uh, the results, outcome, and also the recommendations. Quo Vadis Ukraine is a good um, um, question uh, to, to raise at the end. So since I have not seen any uh, questions uh, from our audience so far, I would like to start uh, with our domestic dimension um, on uh, the current situation, but also especially on the question you have asked. Is Zelensky the good naive one who is not aware or is he very well aware and just uh, like playing good cop or bad cop uh, with the people um, around him and so um, I would like uh, to have um, a couple of introductory remarks uh, by the former uh, general prosecutor of Ukraine who served under President Zelensky for some months and of course knows some of his, let's say, agenda. Uh, and and uh, um, I would be also extremely interested in what's your opinion on, uh, for example, um, the uh, land swap, uh, land swap <laughs> the, the prisoner swap. Um, after I've talked uh, to the families and uh, members of uh, the victims of Maidan activists, I mean, they were so disappointed they couldn't understand what was happening how could somebody let the last five barecoot officers go to russia while everyone knew that was the let's say i mean the the biggest wish from coming from russia for a long time and poroshenko could resist uh, for for his 
uh, time being in office and now only after a year or not even a year in office uh, that swap was was a done deal and so from a legal point of view your lawyer and at that time you were I think still in office what what could be uh, your uh, interpretation of that deal Ruslan you have the floor you have to unmute yourself first sorry Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to participate in this, uh, I think, very important uh, event. Um, I will start the, from the point that uh, I have uh, spent uh, several months uh, in the team of the President Zelensky and before that in the team of the candidate, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. And I won't say that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky is like weak or very nice person. I would say that Volodymyr Zelensky is uh, he's very pro-Ukrainian. This is the point number one. He's very pro-Ukrainian. He's very smart. And he is absolutely perfectly understanding what he is doing. Um, but still, still, there is an issue of a president's entourage. And we see how it could influence on what the president is doing. I would say that um, the run of the well, like three different eras or periods of uh, Zelensky's presidency. First is the era of Andrei Bogdan in the uh, office of the president. And I would like to remind that it was a period of a turbo regime. There were a lot of uh, reforms launched at the period of time and many of them were um, implemented during the several months. Um, I just would like to, To, to recall some of them, like first of all, we, we started the reform of the office of the president. Our idea was to, to transform the administration of the president to the very strong analytical center, which should support the president of Ukraine. And our idea was to, to make an attitude to the president's office um, in order just to establish that the president of Ukrainians Uh, should not rely on those who are on the Bankova street or who are in the president's office. Ukrainians should rely on a strong democratic institutions. So the idea was just to decrease the influence of the presidential office as a center of powers, center of influence in Ukraine to make it also analytical center and to make stronger institutions. Uh, one of them was the prosecutor's office. We started the reform of prosecutor's office in September of 2019. Another one was uh, launching of the work of the high anti-corruption court. Just in one month, we found an excellent premises for the high anti-corruption court. And in two or three months, the high anti-corruption court started its working. It was quite complicated task for us, but we managed to do this. Then we um, amended uh, an anti-corruption legislation. We re-established uh, like criminal liability for the um, illicit enrichment. We managed to reset the National Agency for Corruption Prevention. And I'm proud of a new head of this agency, preventive agency, who is very decent um, and very, very active guy on this position. Uh, we also started a lot of um, other uh, reforms. Uh, I would remind just uh, land reform, which also occurred during the time of, uh, of uh, Andrei Bogdan in the office of the president. The key characteristics of Andrei Bogdan, I would say it was that he was the only person uh, whom I know who could uh, say no to, to oligarchs, particularly to, to Igor Kolomoisky. Who, who was, now he is not is, he was the most influential oligarch during the Zelensky era. Um, but then, then everything has changed. Yermak became a head of the presidential office and we see that reforms has stopped. Um, we also, you know, we can see the lack of communication between the uh, political faction of the Sluha Naroda in the parliament and the president's office. We also could not understand uh, what are the principles, uh, how the people are appointed on the most important state positions in, in, in Ukraine. And um, there, there, there are a lot of other issues uh, connected to, to what the Sir Mark's uh, president's office is doing 
now. And yeah, and the third, the third uh, period of uh, President Zelensky presidency, I would call it Biden's era, because we can see the magic changes in behavior of the president's office, office since uh, a new administration in US uh, came into the offices. And right after that, just in a couple of weeks, uh, uh, several sanctions were imposed on some TV channels connected to Russian Federation, which um, I believe strongly believe that this channel is just a weapon, weapons in the hand of Russian Federation. Then sanctions were imposed on proxies of Russian Federation, uh, Federation in Ukraine, I mean Medvedchuk and Taras Kozak, two MPs. A criminal investigation has been started against these two persons. And um, there were also some other actions which are quite positive. I mean, um, a moving forward uh, investigation against Igor Kolomoisky. Uh, several uh, notices of suspicions has been signed by the, have been signed by the prosecutor general. And this is, was very good uh, job. This jo job uh, has been done by na detectives of NABU. And this also is quite like, um, it, it, it wasn't possible just like two months ago before the Biden's administration came into office. And I believe that there is a, like a window of opportunities now. Um, so the president's office now looks like it's changing. Uh, and I believe that there are some opportunities for U Ukrainians, for international partners now to, to change the attitude to reformers and to reforms. Uh, frankly, I see um, two, 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 two most important issues which should be changed in the president's office. First of all, definitely it's uh, president's uh, entourage, the president's team. Because these persons who are around the persons, uh, president and their, their uh, values, um, they are um, like making the president doing what um, what he is doing, uh, like this shadow appointments or shadow actions, um, which uh, we cannot understand, like actions against uh, head of NABU. I mean, the very recent legislation submitted to the parliament, uh, which uh, was inspired by the president of Zelensky. Uh, the other issue is like this is an, an attitude towards the international partners international organizations which called like external management mm, i believe that this came from the from the uh, from, from kolomoisky and from those who are, have like these pro russian values so i think to these two issues should be changed and and then we could start like a new era of the uh, zelensky presidency which could be connected to 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 making reforms um, in, in in ukraine um what else uh, um i have read the uh, this um, this research conducted by marina and i found it very deep and um, very good very detailed uh, i just cannot um, agree with one issue that Yermak has a, like very good negotiations negotiative skills and i just would remind two two examples first is Yermak. Uh, uh, started or established like shadow communications with Giuliani team, trying to establish like partnership between Ukrainian authorities and, and US authorities. And it was definitely a mistake. It was a huge mistake. And the second one is the uh, communications between Ukraine and Russian Federation authorities in terms of um, um, pro, uh, finding the how to, to get back uh, occupied territories. And we see that Ukraine, this, this negotiations failed and very recent steps from Russian Federation shows that this communication skills uh, from your Mark side uh, also failed. And then get back to, to your questions regarding the exchange of prisoners in February of 2020. Uh, you know, mm, there were a lot of arguments why we did it. First of all, definitely we should uh, take care about our, our soldiers who, uh, who were kept by, uh, by Russian Federation, by this um, terrorist uh, republics, DNR and LNR. Uh, and 
uh, another issue is about this uh, police officers, so-called barefoot officers. Um, I just uh, would like to say that three of them, two of them, um, were back to Kyiv right after the exchange of prisoners. So they are attending all the court hearings and they, um, they have not sentenced yet. So uh, in terms of this situation, nothing has changed for them. And it means that all those uh, Ukrainian soldiers, they could just be, be kept, still be kept this year in the in, in Russian Federation. So it shows that we did absolutely right. And I just would like to remind an Israeli uh, experience when they exchanged uh, thousands of uh, terrorists in exchange of one Israeli soldier. So I think that for Ukrainian army, uh, for Ukrainian state, uh, lives and Ukrainian soldiers are, should be most important. Uslan, there is a first question, and I would like to ask the entire audience to pose more questions if you have. What motivated President Zelensky to change his head of office from Bogdan uh, to Yermak? Maybe this would be one more question, and then I would head over to Maxim as our next guest. Uslan, can you maybe comment on um, this? What was the reason for this or the motivation? Uh, I would say that um, to work with Yermak is much more comfortable to, than to, to work with Andrei Bogdan. Andrei Bogdan was uh, very motivated, he was very energetic, he was very tough in moving the reform and in communication with MPs, with those who was a bit reluctant to, to make uh, reforms in turbo regime. And it makes a lot of conflict uh, for, for President Zelensky. This situation wasn't as comfortable as it is now with um, in cooperation with Zermak. The another key reason, I believe, was like a um, shadow alliance between um, Yermak, Kolomoisky, and the president, uh, which led to, to dismissal of Andrei Bogdan, who was uh, very uncomfortable for, to, to Kolomoisky, and, for, for the, to, uh, and which led also to dismissal of the government of uh, Alexei Goncharuk and me from the position of the prosecutor general. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Maxime, so excuse you... me, his, his oh. past with Azarov and in Yanukovych's time, that was not a, an argument, would have been an argument for me, not even to take him, but did, uh, were there not any revelations that came out perhaps from the Yanukovych days and Azarov days uh, that that was an argument? I would have expected such points to raise, but interesting. <laughs> uh, I didn't get your question, sorry. His past was not a role having a, a high function ah, you in the Yanukovych and, regime. You mean Andrei Bogdan's past? Yeah, Bogdan's past, yes. But look, uh, his, uh, his experience in the office of the president of Zelensky, he was absolutely different. And uh, you could not find like any controversial issues with Andrei Bogdan's behavior in the president's office. And now, if we compare two different periods of Bogdan's office and Yermak's office, we can see how, you, how Ukraine is different during these two periods of time. So just it's not just word, but his actions shows what, what was in, in his mind. But I share Michael Gala's concerns, to be honest. That's why I had an, a meeting with Bogdan myself, and he couldn't really satisfy me in that in respect as well. So, Maxime, you're a very, let's say, critical observer um, during the last um, periods, while you're very let's say, smart, analytical thinker uh, that's well known in, uh, in Europe, uh, in Germany, but also within Ukraine. Uh, you're a lecturer, you're head of a chair. And um, well, tell me what you think. Um, how, would you, how would you comment on Marina's finding and what is from you the main takes uh, from this study? Please, you have the floor. So oh, thank you, Viola. Thank you for inviting and giving me an opportunity to share my ideas, so to speak. Well, I will be, as a scientist and researcher, to take a neutral position, I would go a bit philosophical, because what I saw from this research and also from our discussion is the change of the institutional law, institutional role 
of the whole structure of the office of the president. I like that uh, Mr. Rabashapka, Ruslan, presented this in saying this periods, we have one period, we have another era of Zelensky, and I thought of the word epoch, you know, like uh, in French history and European history, we had the Belle Epoque, and once we had the Belle Epoque, a, a picture of the best potential president, servant of the people, presented on the TV, and then he actually became a real person, a real president, and then the changes in institutional namings and names started. And that was a very interesting part because you remember this discussion when we changed administration to office. But what was missing, and as I would like to highlight, once we change something from administration to office, at least in the English language sphere, we now speak not of the servants, but we speak of officers. And we have officers serve, serving really different ends and working with different things. This is one observation, which is very interesting. You also remember this funny discussion to move the office of the president from Bankova Street. We're now discussing what, who is who on Bankova exactly, not in any other location, because that this Belle Epoque idea, imaginary president that just disappeared and vanished. And what we have now, and from my perspective, if I would like to use the historical uh, um, comparison, we now something of uh, formation of Versailles in France. We have kind of not the sunny, sunny king or something, but we have our own Louis, who is trying to organize uh, some sort of um, I don't know, a party, a long lasting party where people get together. And within this office of the president, we have representatives of different structures. We have oligarchs presented, oligarchs that try to have their representation. As you remember the Versailles historically, uh, Louis put all the possible nobles from France. It was not unlike in the Germany, which I love a lot. We have a lot of small, uh, small uh, uh, Fürstentümer, so the very small um, states who collaborate together. But in order to centralize, it was first a poison, the Great Prussia, who managed to do that somehow. In France, you centralize by you need. If, if you are a Ukrainian oligarch, or you have big business. Somehow you need your own representation at this Ukrainian Versailles in Kiev, in Bankova Street. And since it's very different to move Ukraine into a democratic dimension, it's very difficult to, you know, to, to understand that Russia is a constant threat to Ukraine. Now, organizing this some sort of Versailles becomes a problem and a challenge. Because uh, as uh, Mr. Gala asked, why if we have a person who was under Yanukovych regime then incorporated into this Versailles representation, it then causes, a, causes a lot of problems. Thus, um, and, and if we speak of, uh, as uh, Marina presented, it was very good, lack of, and we go by bullet points, lack of competence, lack of strategic vision, lack of transparency. It is because exactly when we speak of Versailles as a place where people get together to protect the interests, to put forward some interests that population is not aware of, and one of them is when we discuss this foreign policy. If you remember, I always, I, I remember this very well when Yermak, when he was, uh, was first talking to journalists, I had an impression that we have at least Minister of Foreign Affairs talking, not head of some form of office. For me, I would expect office manager to talk to people, you know, the office manager organizes the works. Thus, like, you know, because I, I put timing on six minutes for my short speech, so like to, to summarize a bit, I would say you can, you can take more if you have more to say, you're very welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Viola. I think if questions come up, I would gladly answer them. So I would say the problem is mainly, as I understand from the findings, we have institutional change. We have a structure that is still looking for its place and it's organizing. We had this image of imaginary president and when the person elected president, then we have a sort of Versailles where we put people together who talk to each other, who protect the interest, and actually not, they are, they're not working as office people, you know, like office going. In, in Ukrainian, we use this Russian bad word, maybe some people remember, office ne plankton, small people doing small jobs in their offices. So this is not the case. So we really stress that we have a new structure where people are around, about, around and about the king. And there's a good question, actually, if this king is naive himself if he really doesn't know what is going on, because we actually, we now hesitate, but we would see with now, with his presence, and now you understand my comparison with the French kings, when image is very important, representation in media is very important. There's something that was very important for the French court, 
But we are lucky that France, out of this importance of representation of the king, the French got the cuisine and the French got the parfum. So in order to please the king and organize the Versailles, you would need good things to organize. I'm very skeptical that a lot of attention paid to the image in media, an image of the president, if people love him, if the struggle for the popular love, if that would bring about or produce anything positive like the French cuisine or the French parfums that we use. So I'm skeptical about that. And to sum up my short speech, I say, Yes, it is about changing of the institution. It is about the placement of the institution. It is always about the people around our president because they all function as representatives for some interests. And the problem of the populace, uh, populace uh, and our us analysts that we honestly don't know which interests are there indeed. So some interests are always hidden. And the problem is that some of them are hidden within the office of the president. Thank you, that was my short input. Wow, and there was uh, and two more questions coming. So if you would like to pick maybe one and the next one could be then uh, answered by the next speaker. So two questions to all speakers, but whoever feel eligible to a question. If Yermak has no communication with the MPs as Bogdan did earlier, how does the process of promoting laws and policies in the RADA function now? This is maybe also to Marina, but also maybe to Daria, I don't know. Do you see a possibility that Kolomorsky would execute, uh, execute uh, his influence over a dozen of MPs, I think that's even more my uh, com uh, comment, in the Rada in order to destroy the still formal uh, mono majority and bring Ukraine away from the reform agenda if Zelensky angers him enough? So those are two questions. How is the communication going now? And how about um, the role would, of Kolomoisky? Maybe, no, Maxime, can you? Yeah, I would short lance about communication because we also have this contradiction in terms. If we have communication as a direct letter that you have your own faction in the parliament, you order them to vote for a certain way, then you don't need a communication. You just need an effective person to give forward the order. So I, I give the order, you know, like Black Rot in the British Parliament, the person who walks down the aisle, knocks on the door, come on, people, you are invited. So this is not a communication. This is just, I don't know, the border, the person who actually brings the message. It is not a communication. And now it is changing. Right? We see that this Green Coalition is falling apart a bit because from the very beginning, it consisted of different factions within a faction. So actually, I wouldn't say that this is a real communication. The problem is how to build a real communication when you promote laws, provide clear discussion about the content of the laws, and then we can talk about, discuss, uh, about communication. So far, it is mainly just messaging. And messaging is not, it is just, you know, this uh, idea of communication, but I think that there is a huge problem with the definition of communication within the current office of the president, yeah. Very well explained. Daria, you would be, the next one you're following, um, also former Poroshenko, of course, uh, government quite closely. You were included uh, in the last month of Poroshenko's uh, term. Um, and also he was trying, I think, to reach out to NGOs, anti-corruption NGOs especially. But you were also, I think, pretty open-minded when it came to the new presidency of, of uh, President Zelensky, and you had access uh, to, to different, let's see, key people, key persons. How would you maybe also um, comment first on the study and then uh, uh, answer or reply, if you like, um, to one or the other questions which were raised? Thank you, Daria. Thank you, Viola. Uh, thank you, Marina, for, for the study. Uh, uh, I fully agree with Ruslan that within the first uh, 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 period of uh, Zelensky presidency, there were lots of hopes that quick reforms, crucial reforms needed for Ukraine will be implemented. And there were a lot of reform minded people um, in government, uh, in law enforcement uh, agencies uh, and even in the presidential office um, who were committed to that. And this change, significant change and shift into the uh, policy of uh, Volodymyr Zelensky happened uh, a year ago, uh, exactly uh, in March uh, 20, um, 2020. Um, and this is actually a time when the Yermak comes to power. Uh, and indeed, his first press conference was 
um, not even like the Minister of Foreign Affairs, he behaved like a, a deputy president, so like vice president. Um, and some media in Ukraine even joking of him, saying that he is vice president. Um, with Yermak, um, entrance uh, to, to, to power, he started uh, actually cleaning up everyone who was uh, somehow affiliated uh, or being connected to Andrei Bogdan. Uh, so Yermak didn't like Bogdan, there was obviously competition between them uh, and uh, uh, actually uh, this resulted to the uh, to, to cleaning up of a lot of people who were committed to reforms. Um, now uh, Andrei Yermak still uh, is one of the core decision makers and I agree with the study that Yermak, Zelensky, these are two key decision makers of the country. Uh, Zelensky trusts uh, uh, his uh, head of office. Uh, Shefir, and, uh, uh, who uh, is associated with Kalamoyski um, and who has, I believe, um, a little bit post-Soviet mentality, um, he also still plays important role. Um, the good side is uh, um, there emerged the personality of Mr. Danilov, head of the Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. And actually, this was Mr. Danilo who pushed for so um, unexpected but important sanctions against uh, um, TV channels of Viktor Medvedchuk, uh, the pro-Russian, um, I would say, pro-Kremlin politician in Ukraine, uh, who is de facto is a pro-Kremlin agent in Ukraine. Um, so the, the shutdown of these TV channels, the sanctions against um, uh, Medvedchuk, uh, his uh, wife and Taras Kos uh, were very important for Ukraine. Um, and from what I understand and know, this was something that uh, Mr. Danilo worked hard and, and, and pushed out, pushed for. Bad thing is that uh, it did such a personality like Mr. Tataro is still in place and still making decisions. So this is the deputy of Yermak, uh, who is in charge of law enforcement. Um, and um, there was a question of, 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 from Mikhail uh, regarding Bogdan and his, uh, uh, his, his work in the Azarov government. Um, we all had this question. Oh my God, Bogdan, he was working for Azarov government. He worked for Kolomoisky. It's, 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 a, it's a disaster. Uh, but uh, actually the real life showed that um, this very controversial personality of Andrei Bogdan showed some good results, some important good results for Ukraine. But this part, this uh, uh, Tataro uh, is the real disaster. And he also served um, under Yanukovych regime. And he was a spokesperson from Berkut. And during the attack, violent attack on protesters, he was going public and saying uh, why Berkut was doing correct things. So this person then later on worked closely with Andriy Portnov. He is one of the key um, uh, creators of the judiciary corruption under Yanukovych era. Now Andriy Portnov is known as the um, as, as the guy who cooperates closely uh, with Kremlin and who still has a lot of people he controls in the judiciary system of Ukraine. So Tarov is the guy who has close connections to Portno and Portno executes some of his, you know, anti-Ukrainian um, activities uh, through Mr. Tarov. I can't understand what's the reason for keeping Tatarov in office even after he was uh, uh, investigated by NABU and received notice of suspicion. There is clear evidence that Mr. Yermak and President, Zelensky, and President Zelensky himself, they actually used uh, political pressure, used their the control over Prosecutor General Irina Benediktova to rescue Tatarov from uh, uh, criminal investigation for grant corruption. And that grant corruption was actually um, not a simple case. 
uh, it's not just uh, uh, largest um, construction bureau, one of the largest construction bureau and the title of paying bribes uh, on behalf of this largest construction bureau um, in Ukraine. But that was the case where uh, for st state for taxpayers funds, the apartments for the National Guard, for the officers who are actually protecting Ukrainian sovereignty, um, in, in the zone of occupation by Russia um, uh, had to be built. So these apartments had to be built for the National Guard, but then at the end, they went to the private pockets with the help of, uh, of Tatarov. So it's, a, it's a, I believe, the, the largest mistake of Zelensky regarding his, um, uh, his uh, uh, HR policies. Um, uh, and this is the uh, very bad sign that uh, uh, not big changes are happening. Another interesting person within um, President Zelensky's office is Mr. Smirnov. Uh, this person is in charge for uh, judiciary reform. And uh, disregarding that um, President Zelensky said many times that he is for cleaning up the judiciary, uh, the draft law initiated from president is not compliant with what jointly civil society and international partners are expecting from Ukrainian authorities and specifically from President Zelensky. The real cleanup of the judicial self-governance bodies, the High Council of Justice, the High Qualification Commission of Judges. So um, that's, that's important reform because it's part of the uh, cooperation between Ukraine um, and International Monetary Fund. Um, it's one of the top priorities uh, for, uh, for civil society. And it was announced as a top priority for Mr. Zelensky. N nothing um, uh, done uh, at that direction. Uh, so to, 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 to sum up, um, whether there is hope, uh, I think there is some hope. Uh, but uh, with Yermak and Tatarov, uh, unlikely there will be uh, big changes and truly um, um, important rule of law reforms uh, in Ukraine. This is, this is what I think. Um, the most recent uh, events indicate that still President Zelensky uh, or his entourage, well, Yermak and Zelensky Tatarov, they are keeping attacking the National Decorruption Bureau of Ukraine. So just a few days ago, there was registered draft law by the government of Ukraine. We know that it was registered because of the green light from, from uh, Office of the President. And the idea of this law is to dismiss now the director for political grounds. They are showing cover up that it's needed to be done in order to comply with the constitution. Um, and you know, Ukrainian constitutional court uh, is actually playing not on the side of the Ukrainian people, it's playing on the side of uh, uh, corrupt circles. And I believe that some of them are playing on the side of even Kremlin. So they are dismantling. Uh, key reforms, anti-corruption reform. They they decided it's unconstitutional back in 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 Oct October, um, uh, and uh, this triggered significant constitutional crisis in Ukraine. But it also highlighted how important is that the, the judicial reform in Ukraine. So the courts are rotten from the from the top, very high top constitutional court to 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 the bottom. But coming back to to, to Nabu, so. Again and again, during the last year, um, right after the uh, Yermak was appointed um, as uh, head of uh, office, there are attempts to dismiss current NABU director, uh, political grounds and political reasons. And the new one is happening right now. So NABU director can be dismissed for political reasons within two or three weeks. Uh, disregarding that it can break significantly cooperation between Ukraine and the EU, Ukraine and IMF, Ukraine and, and, and the US. And this is, I think, is one of the key goals of those forces who are pushing for such kind of uh, decisions. Uh, so 
what we are observing in Ukraine that there are very powerful forces, oligarchs, um, Kalamoisky specifically, but not only he himself, uh, uh, backed up from Kremlin, who are trying to do everything possible to destroy Ukraine's cooperation with the West. And they are clearly attacking top reforms which are pillars, key pillars of cooperation between Ukraine and the US. I don't understand why Zelensky allows that to happen. Some of the decisions attacking these reforms are coming from him. Some of the decisions to protect these reforms are also coming from him. So there is a big mix in his head. And clearly Mr. Yermak is one of the personalities who is creating this big mix. Mm -hmm. I will stop here. Uh, okay, let's 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 come back. I mean, you have a lot to say, and there's many more questions. But let's bring the colleague uh, from the European Parliament, Michael Gala, in, while we both, uh, met with uh, together with many others, try to keep Ukraine on track. Um, we had a different, let's say, informal meetings. We have formal meetings with our colleagues in Kiev, and. Uh, try to make sure that uh, the key, the cornerstones of the reform agenda um, uh, still um, be irreversible uh, while we know and we see and we observe that's not so easy. Michael, what would be your yes. main, main takes from our study and from, let's say, the acting person around Zelensky? Thank you very much. There is so much to say. Uh, first of all, I, I have to say I like this uh, image uh, with Versailles. Uh, that um, uh, Maxim uh, presented, although the idea of Louis XIV was, of course, to assemble the entire nobility of France on his, at his court in order to have them under control. So that was the idea in Versailles. The, the boss controls the, the, the small ones, the small bo uh, uh, bosses. Uh, uh, here, uh, I think the motivation of those who want to have a, a place uh, either for themselves or for their aid uh, in the Bankova is uh, not to have uh, the boss, uh, the entire control, but to uh, dominate or uh, organize the agenda and, and to preserve their interests. So it, perhaps it's, it's, it's a bit different. Uh, I mean, uh, l'état c'est moi, that was, uh, so say the, the king was the absolute monarch. He controlled everything. I'm afraid the president, if assuming he has his goodwill, he does by no means control everything. And so far, I would say, well, this unfortunately, this image uh, is perhaps not uh, the right one. Uh, if he did and could control all these guys um, around him uh, at some point, then he should uh, close it down uh, and, and, and arrest them all. And, and that would have been it. But that I think that's not the way it, it, it will go ahead. And now, um, having uh, heard about these uh, activities uh, of all um, the people around the president and people like Kolomoisky and other oligarchs, I think what we see, um, or my take is, uh, as they are upgrading their activities, and uh, that started, that was already, I recall, when we were last in Ukraine, I think it was October or November 2019, still uh, with the previous prime minister and we addressed these issues of their activities the prime minister then said oh yes uh, they are seeing uh, that um, uh, the reforms are gaining ground and they are now on the way out they are the people of the past um, and that was his take uh, well he is not there anymore there's a new one uh, i'm not now discussing these arguments but still i think the aggressiveness and the 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 uh, uh, intensity by which these uh, anti-reform forces are undertaking their activities is for me at least uh, a clear signal that apparently the reforms are gaining ground and having an effect uh, because otherwise they wouldn't fight against it. it was, if it was if it were only uh, on the surface, if it were, were not uh, having an effect, then they wouldn't be uh, that active, uh, actively uh, countering it. And still, uh, that doesn't mean that the reform cause uh, is irreversible. I think uh, we are by no means there. Simply the fact that the people of the type that 
among others, Daria described, that they still have a place, that such people can be in the president's office. I mean, that is definitely something showing there is, well, the political culture is still uh, far away from something where we would like to see Ukraine at some point. And still, uh, I think um, our policy and uh, the design, what we are doing, what we have agreed on, uh, always remember, please, uh, Ukraine is the country outside the European Union, uh, which uh, where most uh, financial resources go, uh, the, the first third country where we are engaging and the comprehensiveness of our uh, presence, of our counseling, of our uh, activities uh, shows that Ukraine really matters for us. And uh, we have enough, uh, so to say, how to put it, um, allies in Ukraine or the other way around, the real reformers in Ukraine, be they in politics, be they in civil society, be they in the media or wherever in society, the real reformers have us as their key and staunch allies. And what is our role is now, well, always to uncover, to add to transparency uh, uh, to uh, issues that are ongoing. My experience is there is when something is going on the wrong track uh, and we uh, say uh, foul or we say something, there is, a, there is normally a positive reaction in the sense that they know it's not our interest, it's not our uh, thing that uh, they should do to please us, but they really know when we are uh, showing up or um, saying something uh, on this or that uh, agenda point, uh, they know that we mean it because it's in, in the interest of Ukraine. And then in most cases, at least uh, wrong, uh, wrong, wrong developments or in many cases uh, that what I have witnessed are corrected. And uh, uh, in so far, uh, we together with those inside Ukraine who really want the reforms, we have a chance to go step by step forward. And, uh, and of course, uh, see that um, the wrong guys, some wrong guys are still on the wrong places. But, um, well, <laughs> I'm so I've on several occasions used the, um, the, the this picture or to say, um, for those who uh, are rich and want to remain rich in Ukraine, uh, I have good news for you. You can, in a functioning democracy, you can be rich and law abiding. Yeah, that is not a, a contradiction in itself. Of course, that requires that you either have a good product to sell or you have a good service to deliver. What is not enough in a democracy that functions is that you're only rich because you have good connections and you have ways and means to bypass legislation, to bypass the competent authorities, to bribe one here or there and thereby gain that. And I think we are perfectly with such an approach to, to that is a call on those who are tempted, who are, have not yet made up their mind whether they want to join the reform train or whether they want to uh, stay on the on the wrong uh, platform of a, of a station that leads in the past or, or to Moscow or wherever. And uh, I think uh, we should uh, we should definitely make use of all occasions. And the next one is uh, next week, Monday, when Mr. Razumkov is uh, in Brussels to renew our cooperation uh, agreement between the Verkhovna Rada and the European Parliament to encourage him, first of all, to, to assume the role, uh, to execute the role of the Verkhovna Rada in the institutional setup, and then also inside the Verkhovna Rada to play a positive role towards all political groups and hopefully towards all those who, who really want the reform process uh, to continue. And we have heard in our um, Jean Monnet dialogue that we just had this week uh, with all the political groups in the Verkhovna Rada, really broad praise of, of him as somebody who upholds uh, the role of the institution and in, this, and in applying the uh, the rules of procedure is fair to the different political groups. I think that is already something for the That's, president of an institution. 
That's more than we have in some of the other Eastern Partnership countries. I don't want to mention Georgia here explicitly, but it comes to my mind. So Susan Tudor has another question. Before I give over to, to the other speakers, again, Michael, this is exactly to you, because the new narrative, um, and she was asking how much support does the new narrative that Brussels and some of the EU member states want to exercise control over Ukraine, Brussels as the new Moscow uh, have in the Ukraine population. Um, I mean, that's that's something I've heard uh, that we as a new uh, empirical force or power try uh, to execute, uh, let's say, over Ukraine. Um, well, definitely. What... I mean, life for us could be far easier if we just let things happen and say, OK, let's look how we can how we can squeeze something out of the country or profit or let our uh, encourage our entrepreneurs to to arrange to uh, to 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 do things with the most corrupt ones as long as is the profit for them no definitely we are not so cynical cynical or uh, uh, i think we it is uh, in our interest and in ukraine's interest primarily that this country develops towards a normally functioning democracy what's so strange about that i think we are perfectly in line with the wishes of the people of ukraine of the citizens who expect that, who have clearly, I mean, for what have they gone on the Maidan? Not for the uh, oligarchs to continue their way of, 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 of mistreating and exploiting the countries, the country. Uh, but uh, we have a situation where uh, I think the wishes of the people and re represented at some point by the real reformers and civil society and our uh, and our uh, perspective to have a stable and prosperous neighbor on our side, I think that is uh, that is perfectly in line and has nothing to do with what uh, 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 Moscow's or, or Putin's intentions are. I mean, we are just the opposite. We are the anti-Moscow, definitely. Okay, so there are many of other questions and mainly I start again with uh, um, Ruslan since Irina Solonenko has a question concerning Ruslan. Did Venediktova continue to implement the reform of the prosecution launched by you the way you planned it or rather not? And second question, why sanctions imposed by the EU on some of the Yanukovych associate were lifted? I understand there's a problem on the Ukrainian side of not providing any evidence against those people. Is this right? And another question, uh, maybe also to, to Maxim and Ruslan, uh, who is now calling the shots on foreign policy? Um, and how much influence has the new Biden administration brought to bear on Ukrainian internal and foreign policy so far? And the third question also to Ruslan, um, he believes, she said, uh, Ruslan believe, said he believes that Zelensky is brave and smart. So what does Ruslan think? Why Zelensky didn't express his opinion on the unfair conviction of Sergei Stanyenko and doesn't pay attention to protest at all? Maybe this could be also comment by others. So Ruslan, you would be the first one uh, to comment and to reply to those questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for questions. Um, I will start from the reform of the prosecutor's office. Um, we have, uh, and Vindictova have accomplished the, just the first stay, phase of the reform of the prosecutor's office, which called re-attestation or re-evaluation of all the prosecutors. Um, in my time, in the prosecutor's office, we have dismissed more than 55% of prosecutors. As a, as a result of uh, re-evaluation of prosecutors. Uh, at the latest stages, uh, stages uh, the uh, re-attestation of prosecutors led to dismissal just in 20, 25% of uh, non-decent or non-competent prosecutors. So this is the figures. Uh, the, the next phase of the reform of the prosecutor's office is uh, reset or relaunching of the bodies of prosecutorial self-governance, governance, which should protect prosecutors from the illegal instructions from the top prosecutors, for example. And these bodies also should make them more, more independent. Independency of prosecutors is one of the key, uh, key uh, factors of um, 
uh, of reform of the prosecutor's office. So I haven't heard anything from the prosecutor's office and the prosecutor general about this stage of reform. And it looks that they are going just to postpone this phase of the reform of the prosecutor's office. There are also a lot of indications that uh, many those prosecutors who have been uh, dismissed, they are now back to the prosec prosecutor general office and even they are appointed on uh, higher positions uh, than they uh, occupied before the evaluation process. They um, avoided the process of re-evaluation, re uh, re re-attestation, so it means that they are appointed um, uh, in violation of the, uh, of the procedure. Uh, regarding the sanctions uh, of EU institutions uh, towards the uh, high-level officials of the regime of Yanukovych regime, I agree with, the, with Irina, uh, who asked these questions. Um, uh, these, these sanctions were connected to the evidences which should be submitted by Ukrainian side. And as I understand, understand uh, these uh, evidences have not been uh, submitted to, to the to EU. And that was the reason why EU uh, has uh, has stopped this, uh, this sanctions against the uh, top uh, politicians of Yanukovych regime. Regarding the Sternenko and verdicts, uh, three Sternenko verdicts, I think that Zelensky don't, doesn't comment on this because he is convinced by uh, Smirnov, Tatarov, his aides, and by perhaps Avakov as well that uh, this verdict is absolutely legal and that Sternenko, Sternenko is guilty in all these crimes. And that's why Zelensky is convinced that everything is okay in this situation. That's why he doesn't just doesn't comment on this. Okay, Maxim, you on foreign policy and other comments, please go ahead. Yes, just a brief one. Um, uh, again, a scientific command. I stick to those group of people who believe that you cannot really discern separately, strictly foreign and internal policy. And Ukraine is a good case because when foreign partners want us to secure good conditions for investment, for example, then we need fair courts, then we need good internal. And this is always about how internal and external policies are uh, related together. Secondly, once we start the question something like, how much American uh, administration or how much the European Union has influence on our internal affairs, then we would somebody from the pro-Russian camp uh, going like this and saying, this is external governance. Ukraine lost its statehood. We are like uh, a puppet state governed from above, uh, from above and from below, I don't know, from abroad and stuff like this. This is something very, very tricky. So we, I wouldn't say that there is a foreign actor that fully, uh, some really go as far as to say like, you know, in this fake republics in the east of Ukraine, they put Ukraine like this to stress that Ukraine is non-existent. It's all, already a failed state. So I think it is very important to be cautious saying that there is a, there's an administration in the United States that really governs all in Ukraine. This is wrong, this is not like that. But I'm really glad that it, uh, the, the messages Obama, uh, Obama administration said before, they were heard somehow, but they reacted to. The Biden's administration messages, they're very straightforward, they're very strict, and everybody in Kiev is discussing why the heck our president still hasn't had a telephone call with American's president. If we remember something like that before, it never happened. Everybody is discussing when is this telephone call is going to take place. And this is a positive sign because we're really waiting for some reaction because Ukraine always had a strange image and reputation. We have now at least a chance to improve our reputation to be a reliable partner for both Republicans and the Democrats. So to sum up, I don't like the question that somebody from, from uh, across the Atlantic Ocean governs Ukraine. Secondly, we're now really all stressed and we are discussing if there is a good relationship and how to build a working relationship with Biden administration. This is now in our Ukrainian hands. Thank you. More question. I mean, Andre was really, I think, referring to <clears throat> is foreign policy mainly in the hand of Andre Yamak or other people taking decision, especially on those things related to Russia. What's 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 okay. your my short observation? I think Kuleba is a stronger foreign minister than Prestaiko was. 
But then a good question, because it is not there, but how much our Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, ac is actually working on in the inter um, international affairs? This is a tricky one. But I think our relationships with Russia and America's understanding of how Ukraine should build its relationship both with the European Union and Russia, I think there is an influence. But I would uh, I would describe this influence as something positive because you, Ukraine is now in the position where we need to take clear sides. It is impossible to be neutral or pretend to be neutral all the time. And I believe that we're now in the condition uh, under the pressure and under the condition when we need to take sides and do our choices. And I think that the foreign policy of Ukraine would be about taking very strong choices. Daria, you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, I'm I'm writing my comments. Um, oh, uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the, there was actually the question on um, on on these narratives, uh, how population in Ukraine is getting narratives uh, uh, like that the West is governing Ukraine, Ukraine is losing sovereignty, George Soros will come and kill and eat all Ukrainian kids and all grand eaters and all former governments like Roncharuk, Ryabashapka, they were all Soros kids. So these are very dangerous narratives, very strategically planned and put on the national TV channels on a daily basis. So this is uh, not something that happened just because Ukrainians don't like West. Or... Sorry, even even after Medvedchuk's TV channels were closed, so, so they are spread, dispersed uh, these narratives not only on his channels? Before they were closed, they were already, they have already reached the minds of many Ukrainians. I've seen some reports on analyzing how actually Ukrainians get these narratives, they are getting it. So one of the most effective messages, um, anti-Western messages, is that Ukrainians don't need any support. Ukrainians have to be proud of themselves. No support from the IMF. No one understands in Ukraine merely what is IMF. IMF is perceived like a bank institution with, which wants to make additional money uh, uh, out, of, out of Ukraine. So, you know, all this all this is getting to, to the minds of Ukrainians. And the same messages are being broadcasted uh, still in one plus one channel. It's a Kanamoyski channel. They are being broadcasted still in Renata Akhmetov TV channel, Terka Ukraina. Differently than, so it's not like uh, from early morning till late night, all these messages uh, are the key content, like it was in the Medvedchuk TV channels. This is a bit different approach. However, they have much more audience than Medvedchuk channels. And um, Medvedchuk channels, the, it was important move to, to, to shut them down. However, there are additional smaller channels which are spreading this the same uh, disinformation. Um, so that's really needs a, a coordinated response. There was a question, what should we do? Um, I think that the EU, US, or key partners of Ukraine, how to work together with, uh, with of his key PR and communication experts and Ukrainian civil society to find the joint strategy, how to counteract these uh, messages. This is a hybrid warfare against Ukraine. And it's not just Ukrainians themselves are, are deciding, you know, moving uh, towards uh, uh, cutting cooperation with West. It's actually strategic hybrid attack, attack from our neighbor, which we all don't love, Russia. And, um, Ukrainian corrupt officials, like judges of the Constitutional Court or members of parliament like Andriy Derkach, who is now in the National Security Report of the US, known as a Kremlin agent, Medvedchuk, many others, they are instruments to execute these hybrid threats. And sometimes oligarchs, on the example of Kolomoisky is a very good example, are playing with Russians in order to push for that. So we have to keep this in mind that Ukraine is still in war. There is open aggression, but there are also there is also hybrid aggression, disinformation, and strategic corruption. These are two things which are happening right now, and we have to remember that when we are talking about how to how to, to move forward. 
Michael, you have mentioned, uh, I don't know whether anybody else would like to take the floor. Otherwise, I would uh, give the floor to Michael Gala. Uh, while um, I would like to more in concrete um, ask you about the, the cornerstones. And uh, we have partly linked uh, uh, the re reforms to Poroshenko. Well, we're all not very happy with, uh, let's say, the overall policy, but now uh, looking back, I think we see that there were many achievements um, and, and, and now we really try to, to keep um, uh, Ukraine on track and we see we are losing, we are losing ground. Um, so, I mean, you were saying you had uh, the Jean Monnet dialogue. Um, how would you see uh, the situation in the parliament uh, concerning the influence of the oligarchs on one hand? but also from the understanding of the colleagues in the RADA. Um, do they understand the uh, relevance of their decisions and what it means for the uh, relation uh, towards the European Union internationally? Or is the influence from some of the domestic, let's say, actors so significant uh, that they are actually pushed uh, towards uh, certain decisions? What, what's your... Well, I, I mean, it's always there are these and those. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, those who are uh, with us in such a dialogue, those who are ready, so to say, to also um, have the uh, inter-party, cross-party dialogue about uh, the reform process. I mean, uh, in, in this... Uh, regard uh, in this strong money dialogue, we want to promote on the one hand, uh, well, the the ability and the willingness to to uh, think beyond your own party, uh, but uh, but and to but to form well reform coalitions and to to make uh, in our case the Verhovna Rada uh, working better and really assuming uh, their legislative role. And uh, the scrutiny of, of legislation. I mean, to uh, to get them away from this turbo mode from the beginning. I think is also part uh, uh, because uh, we had an intense dialogue about that. Because they have seen being new in a parliament, and then uh, you're exposed to such uh, an amount of legislation added by spam legislation to. To, uh, by, by interested sources that as has shown they cannot assume their role. And I think uh, with Razumkov and with those who are on the reform track, really, they have understood uh, that they also, in, for their institution, they need to, uh, to, re to work together and to reform it. Well, when they are discussing issues to have an own scientific service or uh, yeah, to, to, to give them their own capacity to to uh, assess things, I think that is for this part, it, there is a good track. I mean, those who are on the payroll of Kolomoisky or others, I mean, those uh, 30 plus people who are uh, on Kolomoisky's role, uh, but what I'm told, I mean, I haven't checked it personally, but these are the figures that we hear. Uh, I mean, they, they will follow uh, the one who pays them extra. Uh, they, they are lost, but um, uh, hopefully uh, also with reform of the electoral law, I, mean, I, I would wish that they come to a point where, uh, for instance, in the next election, they would have open lists in a sense that people can cast preferential votes. And I think the bad guys and those who are making their money in an illegal way, they are known. So if it were possible, I mean, in all the parties, we find the bad guys and the good guys. So they are quite mixed. But if they are fixed on a list, it doesn't help. Or uh, uh, So I would wish uh, in another reform of the electoral law um, that they would definitely uh, find ways and means to give also the citizens and, and those who are knowledgeable the way the possibility to, to give preferential votes for the good guys. That is from the merely parliamentary perspective, the possibility that they can assume. But I think we, with our, uh, with the, the IMF, with very precise uh, uh, conditionality, us, with our macrofinancial assistance, through the implementation of the association agreement and the DCFDA, 
uh, I mean, we have we have a, a leverage there to uh, to insist on the continuation of the reform agenda. And if you look at the economic development, uh, the exchange of trade with the EU, there is huge in many areas, huge positive development. And that is what those who are active therein, they will see that. They will see that uh, they can even become better in their products. They can sell on the European market and are not dependent on the Russian or any uh, Asiatic market. So there are areas where those who are uh, active in this partnership see the concrete advantages and not only for them but also for their employees or for uh, then in, in other areas uh, what I want to mention is the successful decentralization which is definitely a, a positive development uh, to, to put the money where the mouth is in the sense uh, that uh, competences on the local level are supplied then with money and with financial resources and one can see the citizen can see whether the local authorities are delivering mm -hmm. i mean that is that is something uh, that definitely goes in the right direction which must be sustained and uh, now i'm not going on other issues i've talked long enough so there is also there is light and shade but there is more light also coming and uh, that must be supported and uh, the citizens must see uh, uh, in their daily lives that is what is decisive that the cooperation with us also uh, brings about uh, concrete better perspectives for themselves okay so actually i was going to ask all of our ukrainians uh, shortly for one or two sentences to say what we could do to maybe protect Ukraine's sovereignty, but also build up more resilience uh, for Ukraine together with Ukraine. And um, I was uh, very happy to hear how outspoken Daria was about the influence of the Russians. And we have also heard uh, from Maxim about security issues, but maybe before we close for today's session, where we have already reached our uh, eight o'clock, 90 minutes limit, um, I would like to give to all three of you, and maybe if Marina would like to make some concluding remarks, she's very welcome to do so. Uh, a few ideas how we can uh, support the right ones within the administration, but also outside of the administration. We have a big package from civil society on Many things will be mentioned by Michael, but nevertheless, I mean, a more, let's say, targeted support to the right actors in the administration, in the government would be interesting. Yeah, Maxime first, then Daria, Marina, and maybe Ruslan as the latest this time. Maxime, please. I have a very short, very short remark. I think, you know, the phrase, big brother is watching you. I think what they're reacting to is when they feel that they're being observed, I mean now positively, that they that people pay attention to what they do, they discuss, and also outside of Ukraine and comment on it. And like I think that event like we're having now at this very moment, and we have, this is a very good um, indicator that when people feel that they're being watched at, as a researcher, we will all say that people behave differently. So my my I would ask you and your colleagues to be attentively and attentively paying attention to what is going on, discuss it, present it, and host as many events as possible in this format, the way of discussing things that are going on. Thank you. I'm more than happy to do so because I've heard they are not happy with this event. So go ahead, Daria, it's your turn now. Um, I have many things to say, but uh, um, as time limit is I will say one. Uh, all these oligarchs and their corrupt officials um, who are attacking reforms, they are afraid to lose connection to the West. They are afraid to lose the ability to travel to the West, including to the EU, to the EU member states. And they are afraid to educate their kids there, to have some you know, luxurious resorts there. And this is something that motivates them, well, the threat to lose this, this excess, this is something that motivates them to change their behavior. And very important was the example of Alexander Dubinsky. It's the uh, servant of the people, uh, member of parliament. So he was sanctioned by the US. We, we sent a request to state treasury to sanction him. However, he also has assets in Slovakia. He didn't declare this company. The company belongs to him, the company belongs to his wife. 
And he is the call, Kolomoy, he was, now he lost his power, uh, but he was one of the core Kolomoysky people running up a group of MPs of up to 30 uh, people and influencing the decisions of, of Volodymyr Zelensky. So uh, I think that trying to trigger investigations of the source of wealth, a source of funds of Ukrainian officials and Ukrainian oligarchs who are present in the EU member states is a very important step, which is very much needed to help Ukraine and internal forces within Ukraine to move for the good reforms. Perfect. Marina, you are the next, please. Uh, yes, I couldn't have said better than Daria. I think it's such a such a powerful and good idea because usually the main problem with the sanctions is that while uh, people are like ordinary people are suffering from some sanctions imposed on the country, uh, those uh, with money and the resources are you know traveling freely and enjoying good things. Um, on my side, I would, what I would like to add is that, uh, of course, the political pressure and the political support coming from Brussels is. Uh, always important, even though sometimes, uh, you know, it might be not as, as efficient as we want it to be still uh, the phrase, we, we have to do, we have to adopt this law because of Brussels, we have to now vote this way because of Brussels, it, it is there, it is in Verkhovna, and it still works, uh, especially when it comes to human rights uh, laws, such as uh, uh, different amendments uh, related to LGBT rights, uh, uh, things related to other minority groups, uh, it works. And the third thing I think is super important, uh, considering the information war, is uh, support for, in uh, for independent media, which is uh, so lacking in Ukraine. And in addition to that, uh, what, uh, you know, looking at the Baltic countries example, I think we, what we really also need is independent media also um, broadcasting in Russian uh, to, you know, to juxtapose to, to uh, media in Russian uh, uh, you know, bring in uh, Russian agenda. So even though, of course, all this Ukrainization effort is important and, uh, you know, effort worth, uh, still we need some information sources in Russian that would, you know, talk to other groups of the population. Very, very valuable point. Ruslan, you would have the honor to speak. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, I have to say that i absolutely agree with what uh, Daria said. The issue of sanctions is very important, and I just like to remind the issue of Kolomoisky. Uh, when U.S. imposed sanctions against Kolomoisky, EU was quite reluctant to to do something like that, and it was um, an impression in Ukraine that the EU's position was quite weak, and this impressions also exist in the office of the president. Because the language which is uh, which is used by EU officials are um, uh, is very diplomatic and is very weak. And it, um, it's, it's my impression. And I, I saw that a lot of times in the office of the president, they, they don't understand such kind of diplomacy. They need very straightforward, very direct and very tough language. Like um, new president of US is um, sometimes uses. So only if EU use, uh, uses such kind of instruments in communication with, with the office of the president, president um, only in such kind of situations they will understand uh, what is demanded from, from them. The second issue is support uh, of those who are not in government now, who, are, who have implemented reforms in Ukraine, who is still fighting for the for reforms in Ukraine because uh, they are quite often in quite dangerous situation. I just can remind the issue of uh, Vitaly Shabunin's house. Uh, someone burned his house and investigation uh, conducted by police just can, um, uh, have, not, um, have not shown any results uh, um, as for the moment. There are a lot of criminal cases against uh, I started against uh, me, for example, and, and another, and there are a lot of another kind of persecutions of those who are fighting for the for reforms. So you should, in my opinion, should support such kind of peoples. Thanks a lot uh, to all of you. Um, definitely, I think uh, your last point is extremely important: protect individuals uh, from. Yeah, um, criminal structures uh, might be 
state or individual um, whatsoever structures, but they are under attack and that's, that's a good point. Um, and obviously um, individual sanctions, surely important, uh, raise the topics. Uh, I mean, keep, keep them, I mean, watch them and, and make it loudly, um, not too diplomatic. That's also, let's say my line to take but it's not shared by everyone. Uh, Michael is always uh, with me, the only one sometimes speaking out clearly what we mean and not always easy uh, to get uh, to get the uh, colleagues on board, but we do try. And I think you are a good examples for our alliance um, in Ukraine and you are the, the changes um, of, of demo, oh, no, you are the um, actors of democratic change and you are the ones uh, who, who who we would like to support for a different, um, hopefully, uh, Ukraine in the near future. So thanks a lot to the audience and to um, the very valuable and extensive questions. Um, please read the study if you're interested. You'll find it either here in the chat. Uh, we have uh, um, put it uh, online on my website. We will post it. Um, below this recording, of course. Hope to see you soon again, even better in person, be it in Brussels, Berlin, Kiev, or wheresoever. Uh, looking very much forward, stay healthy, and thanks a lot for attending this uh, webinar and being interested in the topic. Thank you for thanks organizing you. that. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dalia, Ruslan, Thank Miguel, Thank Marina, thanks a lot. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.